Continuing our trip to Wyndham here in New York, uh, I'm standing here with two talented musicians that shortly will be playing us a song. They don't have to know we already recorded the song part, of, but that, now that it's on tape, it already is. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, okay, we're backwards here, but that's okay. It's New York, and you guys are from? We're from Virginia. From from Williamsburg, Virginia area? I'm, I'm from Virginia. Well, we're both living in the Williamsburg area now. I'm from a Virginia originally, and Arden is from New York originally. Oh, okay. What well, part of New York? Upstate. I'm from Schenectady. Schenectady. Mm -hmm. That's the one word in the world I, I can't spell, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you guys been playing music? Oh, three, four years. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 And you basically are doing uh, Civil War period? or do We do Americana music Americana. from uh, earliest days of colonialism to uh, actually about 1930, 1940. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite? Uh, Civil War is probably my favorite, and that's just because we, because of the popularity of Civil War, we do a lot of Civil War programs. How about you? Yeah, but pretty much the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Civil War. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's uh, she's a classically trained violinist, and I'm not. Yeah. Uh, and so therefore, uh, I think that she actually prefers Celtic tunes a little really? bit. Really? Yeah. 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 Maybe you have a little the, leaning Celtic there. Celtic women yeah. thing. And, <laughs> <laughs> ever see that girl in Celtic women? Yeah. Yeah, she's okay. pretty impressive, you know. I Dancing agree. And playing fiddle all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> So um, I could probably let these folks know that are going to be watching this on Facebook. <laughs> uh, uh, what's the name? What's the name of your band? Hudson and Clark. Hudson and Clark, Hudson which and Clark. is your last name. Yeah, right? I'm Hudson. She's Clark. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And we play for uh, we play in a larger band sometimes mm -hmm. called the Cigar Box String Band. And that's what you're performing tonight at the Grand Concert. No, it, it'll be us. They 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 have the name in the program Cigar Box Band because we were in the band. But uh, okay. we're I'd just be Hudson and Clark tonight. Okay. <laughs> and can you give us a little? preview of the names of the tunes you're doing tonight or um i don't know uh 8th of january, uh, 8th of january. okay 8th of, she's telling me 8th mm -hmm. of january Which and is, uh, that's the same as uh battle, battle, of, new battle orleans. of new orleans right, right. i knew that yep. and then uh old lang syne and <laughs> okay. maybe maybe amazing grace uh, okay sounds like a good plan to great. me all mm -hmm. right we'll, we'll get little clips of that on the video later great on. thank so, you yeah yeah, yeah. Thank you. and um thank you for Already performing the song that when the <laughs> folks are watching this, they'll see it now. Uh, yeah. Could you could you kind of lip sync it on the tape and make it look like we're really playing? No. no. I didn't, when I bought my editing system, I didn't spend the extra dollar for that. Oh, <laughs>
continuing our trek through Wyndham here. I'm sitting here with Michelle Katona, who's been a longtime friend of mine, and she's a Jersey person just like I am. <laughs> so, uh, Michelle, what brings you to Wyndham? What brought you to Wyndham for the past, what, 10, 15 years? Well, it first came here for the music, but then I made a whole bunch of friends. And now this is where I get to meet and be with my friends that I've made throughout the many, many years. And new ones too. Oh, absolutely. I make new friends all the time. Mm -hmm. So, made Michelle, one this morning. Yeah. Michelle is a uh, Civil War reenactor that does a medical scenario. I guess that's not the right yes, word for I that. Yes, I uh, portray a nurse. Portrays a Civil War nurse. Yeah. And I know that she has a collection of Civil War tools or whatever you call them. Instruments, instruments yes. Instruments, yes. not these kind of musical instruments. Yeah. So. Well, it's we... Instruments for, like, cutting people apart and putting them back together? I like to put them back together. Yeah, well, that's what nurses do. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And how long have you been doing that? Oh, this will be my 21st year. Really? Yep. Yeah. 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 So So you get dedicated to these kinds of things, and it's a good thing because it's an educational process. You get hooked on it. Yeah, you do. Yeah. So Michelle drives up here alone this year, whatever, for a three-hour drive, give or take. Yeah, it was a two-hour drive that turned into like a four-hour drive. Well, the, yeah, on the yeah. Jersey Turnpike, that's not a surprise. Well, it wasn't the Jersey Turnpike, it was the New York Thruway. Oh, really? Yeah. See, I came up the uh, the Garden State Parkway, and that was a parking lot. Ah, yeah. okay, yeah. You just never know. Yep. So, uh, thanks for talking to us. Oh, thank and, you, Rich. Uh, we'll be uh, we'll be posting this on on the infamous Facebook. <gasps> I know. So all your friends will see you and say, "Oh, that's Michelle." No. Yeah, yeah. Uh oh. I'll be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I always am, so it doesn't matter. Right? Okay. Well, at least we're in good company. Yeah. Stand, okay. stand by. We got more stuff coming. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> oh, hard times. more musicians here at Wyndham and these guys happen to be sort of local because they're New Yorkers and we, we say that in New Jersey just to make fun of you guys you realize that you know <laughs> so uh, they are called the Irish volunteers and how long have you guys been together just real quickly uh well, that's a complicated answer um, because... Uh, that goes into his parentage and, and all of that. I've been playing with these guys for about 13 years now, but how long would you say you guys have been playing together? 25? 25, 25 years. years. This happens to be a father-son outfit here, so I guess dad gets to say whatever he wants to, and son, as most sons probably don't yeah, listen, right? I, I don't, but I go okay. along with it. Okay, so we have, uh, we have a plethora of talents here, aside from vocalists, guitarists, and flautists and uh, other stringed instruments of various complications. Uh, you also happen to be a, a medical doctor of sorts. That's, that is correct. Can you tell us a little bit about that before we get into the music aspects here? Uh, yes, I am an otolaryngologist, which I'm sure you can probably spell, ear, nose, and throat. And you're a surgeon? Yes. Okay, so you like take people's heads off, fix it, and then glue it back on? Yes, that is correct. Okay, I, remind me not to go to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the radio. 
Come back, Katie, Kelly, Benjamin, and Brady, and the boys from Alabama. You know they're looking for Mr. Butter, Runny Bunny, Titchy, but don't you tell your mama. You know they look so fine when they're marching in a line, and they dance even finer than the boys of Carolina. Come back, Katie, with your best dress on, the Bama boys in town. Katie, Kelly, Benjamin, and Brady, and the boys from Alabama. You know they're looking for Mr. Butter, Run and Titchy, sister, but don't you tell your mama. Kevin, Benjamin, and Brady setting out on my veranda. They raise the shimmer and the whistle, and they play it on the whistle to the fiddle and the banjo. We're gonna make some noise with the Alabama boys. Gonna dance to tomorrow when we never had a sorrow. Come back, Katie, with your best dress on. The Bama boys in town. Benjamin and Brady and the Alabama Wild Keys. They were born in Connemara and they're leaving town tomorrow and they're gonna fight the Yankees. Gonna dance and sing, make the whole town ring, make a racket and a rattle when we send them off to battle. Come back, Katie, with your best dress on, the Bama boys in town. Kevin, Benjamin, and Brady, and the boys from Alabama. You know they're looking for a Mr. Better, run and tell your sister, but don't you tell your mama. Well, now they look so fun when they're marching in a line, and they dance even finer than the boys of Carolina. Come back, Katie, with your best dress on, the Bama boys in town. Come back, Katie, Kevin, Benjamin, and Brady, and the boys from Alabama. You know they're looking for a Mr. Better, run and tell your sister, but don't you tell your mama. Well, they look so when they're marching in a line And they dance even finer than the boys of Carolina Come back, Katie, with your best dress on The Bama Boys in town Come back, Katie, with your best dress on The Bama Boys in town Okay, continuing our story here at Wyndham I'm standing here with the renowned artist Paul Martin the third, fourth? The third Third, okay, I got it right the first time Paul is a New Yorker who specializes in military style art. Yes. Okay. I'll let him do the talking since I'm really the novice here. So tell us about what you do, Paul. Um, well, I'm uh, an artist. I do um, military and historical artwork. Um, I've been doing it uh, for a fairly long time. Actually, ever since I was a kid, but seriously and professionally probably for about 30 wow, years. So. Um, and I've just always been a history buff. My um, parents, when we were kids, took my brothers and sisters and I to all the historical sites around our country, Civil War battlefields, museums, um, places you know, like that of historical significance for our country. And um, as I started you know, learning my own uh, drawing and painting skills, I gravitated towards depicting um, military subject matter and uh, historical parks and uh, landscapes of battlefields, uh, kind of contemporary modern interpretations of battlefields in some respects, um, the monuments and the, the landscape right. of Gettysburg and the other battlefields around our country. Well, aside from being an artist, uh, I happen to know that there's a side life to this gentleman. He has, a, we talked about this a little earlier today, he has an interest in, in World War II. World War II also, would you yes. call that reenacting or would you call it historical um, impressions? Yeah, living history, living history. reenacting. Okay. It's okay. kind of a, a crossover um, <laughs> title, I guess, to it. Um, but I'm affiliated with a couple of World War II groups, um, the Army Air Forces Historical Association, which is based out of New Jersey. And we uh, pay tribute and honor 
the World War II aviators who flew um, in defense of our country during World War II, and we do displays. And everybody has their own bomber? Is that this? Is yeah, we all fly in on a B-17 for our meetings. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and there actually is another side to this gentleman. It's a three-sided gentleman. That in the World War II world, he actually portrays the infamous Bob Hope. Bob Hope. Can you give us a one-liner? A one-liner from Bob Hope. Well, <laughs> I uh, put him on the spot here. Yeah, you used to put me on a, on a side because I usually have uh, use some cue cards to remember <laughs> before I go on stage. But um, I'll tell you, Rich, um, I was walking across the airfield the other day, and I was stopped by a GI, and the GI stopped me, and he said, "Hey, Bob." He said, "Bob, do you know the difference between a hippo and a zippo?" And I said, "Sure." A hippo is very heavy, and a zippo is just a little lighter. Ay vey. <laughs> I had to ask. I got to tell you. I got to tell, hey, tell, tell you. Well, if we run across Bing Crosby, maybe we can get into a couple of road movie lines for us or there something like go. that. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Richard. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very, yeah. very much. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh.
going to do a tune written by Jerry Holland called My Cape Britain Home. And it's a beautiful, sentimental tune, and we hope you'll enjoy it.
的永丰盛。
You get there before I do. I'm bound for the land of Canaan. Now for me, I'm coming to. I'm bound for the land of Canaan. Canaan, right Canaan. I'm bound for the land of Canaan. Canaan is my happy home. I'm bound for the land of Canaan. With me, beloved friend, I'm bound for the land of Canaan. The joys of heaven never end. I'm bound for the land of Canaan. Canaan, right Canaan. I'm bound for the land of Canaan. Canaan is my happy home. I'm bound for the land of Canaan. Canaan, right Canaan. I'm bound for the land of Canaan. Canaan is my happy home. I'm bound for the land of Canaan. We bring a new star. We are bonded oh. together in the golden gay weather, in the pride of our affection for California. A ballad for the ladies, for the home and for the baby. Come, told you for the ladies, the baby, the home. A ballad for the ladies, for the home and for the baby. That rises so high. We are coming with the others, three sisters, three brothers, and we'll have the next election, or we will know why. A ballad for the lady, for the home and for the baby. Come forth for the lady, the baby, the home and the I was given a few other, few other names. Uh, one is uh, Jim Kralik. Jim Kralik was the uh, Rockland County Sheriff who passed away at 74 years of old after a long battle with cancer. Uh, Jim was loved history, and uh, he had tremendous respect in his community. And we met him because Jim was the, uh, owned the Artillery Ridge Campground, which is in Gettysburg, and we had the honor to play there several times. And when we played a show in Farewell, we would always do it to Jim doing the narration of the Sullivan Blue Letter. And it was always very moving, you know, for the audience. So uh, as part of our tribute, we honor the memory of Jim and all that he meant to his community. And then Bob Gardner, who was a former Vietnam veteran. Uh, Bob was very active in the living history community for many years. And the last time I had a chance to talk with Bob was at an event that we did for the Sorgates Historical Society. And uh, he was dying of, uh, of cancer also. So we include them uh, in tonight's uh, program. Our other the other folks that we want to remember, and we're going to say a few words about each of them in a minute. Uh, Leo Sinikowski, Lee Hauser, Cliff Spear, Doug Hull, and Jack Fettinger. Bruce Catton wrote, We are the people to whom the past is forever speaking. We listen to it because we cannot help ourselves. 
for the past speaks to us with many voices. Far out of the dark, nowhere, which is the time before we were born, men and women who were flesh of our flesh and bone of our bone went through fire and storm to break a path to the future. We are part of that future that they died for. They are part of the past that brought the future. What they did, the lives they lived, the sacrifices they made, the stories they told, and the songs they sang, and finally the deaths they died, make up a part of our own experience. We cannot cut ourselves from it. It is as real as something that happened last week. It is a basic part of our American heritage as Americans. Leo Sinikowski, I always referred to Leo, he was sort of like the, the gentle giant. He was dedicated to community service. Uh, I know how much he loved his wife, Judy, uh, and their cat. And uh, Leo made a great salad broth, and we were fortunate to have dinner a number of times at uh, Leo's house with, uh, with him and Judy. And uh, uh, I think about Leo uh, every day. And Leo was, uh, did our sound at, enough, at many of our events. He was the sound man here for the Linden Gathering for a number of years. And, I introduced him to Jonathan, and uh, the last time we worked together, he and Jonathan were part of a team for an event that we were doing here at the Center Church. So, uh, part of my thoughts are, you know, with Leo and certainly with uh, with Judy. Uh, I couldn't help but think about as the bells were ringing uh, that. that they were ringing for them in heaven. Lee House. Nineteen years ago, as a part of the window bicentennial, this whole thing started. Yeah. Um, one of the first people to attend our birthday campus was Lady Mary Hamilton. In the 19 years that we've done this, we missed one. And that was when his son got the tickets to watch the Giants play in the Hall of Fame game out in Kansas, Ohio. <laughs> On this weekend, but he was here every year with us. I think I met Lee 25 years ago, probably longer than that, on the field of Gettysburg. And it was the beginning of a, it was the beginning of a friendship that, for my part, was based on the admiration for the man, who he was, what he knew, and the type of person that he was. I don't know how many more years, I know I said this in Gettysburg, I don't know how many more years that I'll be able to walk across that field on July the 3rd the way we do every year. I have no idea. But I do know that as long as members of the Civil War Heritage Foundation come across that field, Lee will be with them. Just like I don't know how many more years this thing will go on. Is this the last one? It, it feels like it tonight. <laughs> but it doesn't matter whether it goes on for a hundred years. Lee House will always be a part of it.
Cliff Spear, Richmond Hill. <laughs> Cliff is a member of uh, our Civil War band, the Living Prison Minstrels, uh, for probably 20 years. And I've been coming to Wyndham with Cliff since at least 2002. I can't remember any further back in that. But, and Cliff was always with me. And uh, he heard myself and a couple other musicians in reenactment camps playing music, and he was not a musician. So he decided that he needed to learn to do something. So he took up percussion, Civil War percussion, the bones, the tambourine, all those little weird little things that you see used in that kind of music. And he became quite proficient in those instruments. So for probably close to 15 years or so, he was a member of the Minstrels. And uh, the Minstrels actually stopped coming here uh, in bulk for one reason or another, but Cliff and I never did. And I guess uh, this is the first year without him. He was actually born about two miles down the road. So he's actually a native of this area. His grandfather built two houses side by side on Route 29 down here. As you leave town, it's on the left hand side about two miles down. And uh, he's, he was a, a nurse. He died of cancer this year. And it was his fourth bout of cancer. And the odd thing about it was he was a cancer nurse. So he knew what was going on in his own body. Uh, the first three times he fought it, and he didn't do well with chemo. It was, he was allergic to it, but he had to have it. So he had his chemo, uh, and, and they kept him in the hospital all those times. Finally, the fourth time, the cancer hit his brain. And he decided that um, he didn't want to burden anybody, the, the living person minstrels, me, his two sisters who he adored, like you can't imagine, and his daughter who was just graduating college. So he decided to stop his medication because he was always thinking about the people. That was Cliff. That always came first. In the reenactment world, he started out as a private, like most of us do when we join a reenactment group. And he ended up as a lieutenant, and the regiment loved him. He was kind, but he was firm, and they knew he was in charge. And he was just the kind of guy that would do anything for anybody. And uh, when we heard that he was on his own deciding to pull the plug, which he was he did. Uh, we understood. But like any other death, cancer is a nasty thing and it, it, it's something you can't really deal with. You can't control it. You have to deal with it. And he did. And he just closed his eyes one day and he's now buried in Gettysburg's Evergreen Cemetery along with some honorable soldiers who flew in those days we've been talking about all weekend. So he's in good company. And uh, Cliff, we miss you. Uh, Doug Hull. Doug Hull was the, uh, the coordinator of the Civil War Weekend event in Troy, New York, uh, along with his wife, Maria. Maria predeceased Doug with uh, brain cancer, and uh, Doug unfortunately lost his battle with cancer this, uh, uh, just recently. And uh, Doug was another person who was very giving. Uh, he uh, was always there for you. He was a tremendous supporter of the of the Balladeers. Uh, he was a, an active Mason, and uh, again, he's another person that we uh, that we praise with this. John. Seventeen years ago, I started reenacting. Thanks to this gentleman here. Don't blame me. It's all your fault. My first um, event that we went to was in, I believe it was Ledgeworth, other than being in Gettysburg. And I met this gentleman, an older gentleman, and anybody that was around this gentleman, he took in his family. Um, and being a member of the Heritage Foundation, there are many family members. But Jack portrayed General Lee. My son at the time, four or five years old, comes to me and says, Dad, pretty sure he was in the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> I portray Sergeant George 
Washington Tucker was the chief courier and personal bodyguard of General Lake. <laughs> Tucker was the only non-commissioned officer to escort Robert E. Lee to Appomattox Courthouse on the day that they surrendered. That afternoon, Tucker held the traveler outside of the courthouse, took the bit out of the traveler's mouth and was feeding him apples. Robert E. Lee came off the porch, and as many people who know the traveler, all he had to do was the traveler's ears came up, and if he was harnessed, he came to Robert E. Lee's side. That afternoon, <clears throat> I had screwed up, or Sergeant Parker had screwed up, and did not have him ready to be ridden away. Robert E. Lee was very upset. <laughs> and he told Sergeant Tucker if he hadn't just surrendered, you would probably be decommissioned and working somewhere in a shipyard. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that was Jack's and my joke. So one Christmas I thought I was going to be smart and I sent him an apple. <laughs> Two weeks later I got a jar of applesauce back. <laughs> So that was one of the jokes. Um, Jack will be missed. He retired from doing General Lee several years ago, but I kept in touch with the gentleman. Um, like I said, he was a very close family man, and he loved each and every one of us. And he will be missed. Thank you. We're going to do a piece for you now followed by the scene of Old Lang Syne, a uh, piece that was written by Nathaniel Graham Shepard, poem, and it's called Roll Call. And Wanda, if you could come up, are you going to marry you from there also? Okay. Uh, and we'll follow that with Old Lang Syne. Is Ken here, Ken Purcell? Where's, is, where's Ken? Okay. Uh, he was going to play the piano on Old Lang Syne, we'll we always have a plan. Roll Call. Nathaniel Graham Shepard wrote the poem Roll Call. It gives us a glimpse into the actual life of battle as regiments and companies reform to learn the extent of their losses. The names used in this version of the poem are from the original roster of the 79th New York State Militia Volunteers, Highlanders, in June 1861. Of the 1,000 officers and men that went into battle under a three-year enlistment, 558 did not return. All right, Andrew. Attention to the call of the wall. Answer up when your name is called. If a person does not respond, someone speak up for him. Sergeant Addison. The order we cried. Here, First Sergeant. Was the answer, loud and clear, from the lips of the soldier who stood near. And here was the word the next replied. Corporal Gilmore. Then a silence fell. This time no answer followed the call. Only his rear man had seen him fall. Killed or wounded, he could not tell. There they stood in the failing light, these men of battle with grave dark looks, as plain to read as open books. Well slowly gathered the shades of night, the fern on the hillside was splashed with blood. And down in the corn where the poppies grew were redder stains than the poppies knew. And crimson dyed was the river's flood, for the foe had crossed from the other side that day in the face of a murderous fire that swept them down in its terrible ire, and their lifeblood went to color the tide. Lynn Stewart. At the call there came two stalwart soldiers in the line, bearing between them this William, wounded and bleeding, to answer his name. Private James Sinclair. <coughs> And a voice answered. Here, First Sergeant. Corporal Peter Sinclair. But no man replied. 
They were brothers, these two. The sad wind sighed, and a shudder crept through the cornfield nearby. John Windsor. Then a soldier spoke. John carried our regiment's colors. When our ensign was shot, I left him dead. Just after the enemy wavered and broke, close to the roadside his body lies, I paused a moment and gave him to drink. He murmured his mother's name, I think, and death came with it, and he closed his eyes. I was George Quinn. Then a soldier spoke. He was with our colonel on the second charge of that hill. Twas the last time I saw of them both. Twas a victory, yes, but it cost us dear, for that company's roll when called at night, of a hundred men who went into the fight, numbered but twenty that answered. Here. Old Lang Syne. 